Beneath the scorching sun of Iran's southern coast, the earth cracked open with a secret. Not long ago, a team of archaeologists stood at the edge of a forgotten ruin. Dust clung to their clothes. Sweat blurred their vision. But what they uncovered was no ordinary relic. It wasn't a palace, or a tomb, or a monument to war. It was a system. A stone-carved water system, etched into the hills of the ancient port city of Siraf, designed with a brilliance that defied its age. Basins, canals, filtration chambers, all laid out with mathematical precision. Not with computers, not with machines, but with knowledge. Refined, tested, passed down by memory and observation. This wasn't survival, this was mastery. Centuries ago, Siraf had been a bustling maritime hub on the Persian Gulf, its harbors alive with ships from China, India, and East Africa. They came bearing silk, spices, ceramics, and left with Persian pearls and dreams of return. But in the 10th century, an earthquake struck. The city crumbled. The people fled. Sand reclaimed the ports, stone by stone. For a thousand years, Siraf was erased, until now. And beneath its ruins, we found something extraordinary, a blueprint for the future, carved in stone, hidden in plain sight. At first glance, the structures looked like eroded basins, stone depressions cracked and weathered by time. But closer inspection revealed something astonishing. These weren't random pits. They were precision-engineered cisterns, layered in tiers across the slope of a rocky hillside. Shallow channels carved into the rock guided seasonal rainfall into the highest basin. From there, water passed, filtered, cooled, preserved, through a sequence of chambers. Some basins were shaded by natural rock formations. Others were buried deep enough to escape the searing desert heat. Each was angled to prevent overflow and erosion. Sediment settled at each level and in the lowest tanks, over three meters underground, cool, clean water could last for weeks. No pumps, no plastic, no fossil fuels, just gravity, rock, lime, and genius. Some compartments were even lined with clay-lime mixtures, a primitive but effective waterproofing technique. Tiny grooves allowed sediment to flush out. Overflow drains protected the system during flash floods. There's even evidence that different water types, potable, agricultural, animal, were separated by design. In a place where every drop mattered, this was not improvisation. This was water mastery, centuries before the first modern pipeline. So why haven't we heard of this? Unlike Rome's aqueducts or India's majestic stepwells, Siraf's water system vanished from the record. Forgotten by history, ignored by textbooks, even local folklore barely mentioned it. That changed only recently. It took a combination of satellite imagery and local oral histories to prompt an expedition. Researchers from Iranian universities and global conservation teams descended on the site. What they saw left them stunned. It wasn't just advanced, it was scalable, it was low maintenance. It worked with nature, not against it. And somehow, no one had been talking about it. Seraph, it seemed, had been whispering to us through sand and stone. We just hadn't been listening. Seraph may be the headline discovery, but it's not alone. Across the world's driest regions, ancient civilizations built extraordinary water systems, many of which have been dismissed as primitive or simply forgotten. In ancient Persia, engineers carved khanats, underground channels that tapped into mountain aquifers and transported water across miles using only gravity. Unlike exposed aqueducts, khanats prevented evaporation, no power, no pollution, some still function today. In Petra, the rose-red city of the Nabataeans carved into sandstone cliffs survived not because of its beauty, but because of its water. Engineers diverted rare desert floods into cisterns, pipes, and reservoirs carved high into the cliffs. Their storm overflow tunnels still inspire awe. In the Atacama Desert, one of the driest places on Earth, ancient Chileans learned to harvest fog. They stretched nets woven from plant fiber to capture microscopic droplets from coastal mist. These fog nets dripped clean water into containers an idea so clever it's being revived in Peru, Morocco, and beyond today. In India, majestic stepwells in Gujarat and Rajasthan, giant vertical shafts with spiraling staircases, captured monsoon rain and preserved it for dry months. Some were so vast, they held millions of leaders. They were also cultural hubs, places of worship, gathering, and ceremony. In North Africa, Berber communities built subterranean cisterns beneath their homes, cool, dark, immune to evaporation. Later, 
the Romans scaled these ideas up into massive underground reservoirs that supplied entire cities like Carthage. None of this was accidental. This was adaptive architecture, a sacred contract with water, a deep understanding of land, climate, and consequence. Now, fast forward to today. Across the globe, water is running out. California's aquifers are vanishing. The Colorado River is drying up. Neixepiners, Sao Paulo, and Chennai have all come dangerously close to day zero when municipal taps run dry. In East Africa, entire villages are migrating as wells turn to dust. Megacities rely on desalination pulling fresh water from oceans with massive energy costs and environmental damage. We've built dams, pipelines, and treatment plants that span nations, but they're brittle, over-engineered, dependent on energy, capital, and centralized control. And in the face of climate chaos, they crack. So we must ask, have we engineered ourselves into a corner? It turns out, the answers we seek may already exist. In Rajasthan, ancient step wells are being restored to support urban water needs. In Tunisia, buried cisterns are being reactivated with little more than a shovel and a plan. In Kenya and Ethiopia, aid groups are training communities to build sand dams, a simple, ancient method that traps water beneath riverbeds for year-round access. In California, Architects are studying Persian and Indian water architecture to build passive cooling systems and gravity-fed irrigation into homes. And in Morocco, drones are mapping ideal spots for fog nets, using ancient Atacama knowledge combined with modern tools. This is no longer about nostalgia. It's about survival. These systems work because they are simple, local, scalable, off-grid. They require no imports, no fuel, no permission and they put power back into the hands of communities, not corporations, and were only scratching the surface. Scientists are now analyzing sediment samples from Suroff cisterns to reverse engineer natural filtration techniques. Urban planners are integrating gravity-fed storage tanks into modern city grids. Tech startups are pairing AI with historical rainfall data to optimize ancient harvesting methods. Archaeologists are using LIDAR and satellite scans to trace forgotten khanats across Iran, Iraq, and beyond. Even in cities like Phoenix, Dubai, and Cairo, developers are looking backward to move forward, exploring passive water design that mimics ancient desert logic, shade, slope, stone, and sustainability. It's not just what the ancients built, it's how they thought, long-term, local, aligned with the rhythms of nature. Here's the deeper truth. Ancient water systems weren't just technical solutions. They were cultural philosophies, designed with respect for water's scarcity, power, and sacred role in life. They encourage stewardship, collective maintenance, resilience. In contrast, modern systems are invisible, impersonal. You open a tap, water flows, you never ask where from or at what cost. And that disconnection breeds waste, fragility, and exploitation. We treat water as a commodity. The ancients treated it as a gift. So as the climate warms, rivers dry, and billions face thirst, we must decide, do we keep dominating nature, demanding more from a dwindling source? Or do we return to a mindset that listens, observes, and adapts? The reappearance of Siraf is more than an archaeological footnote. It's a warning. It tells us how much we've forgotten. It shows us what's possible when we build with patience instead of power. And it reminds us that resilience doesn't require complexity. It requires compatibility. This isn't just history. It's a mirror. Siraf's stone basins speak to us not from the past, but from the future we still have time to shape. Because the water crisis isn't coming. It's here. Imagine this, a desert city, no rivers, no electricity, no plastic, and yet clean, cool water flows from rock-cut basins beneath the earth. No pumps, no pollution, no dependence. That city isn't fantasy. It was Saraf, and it can be our future. The past has been waiting. Let's listen.